Our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you for being among us today and for this opportunity to gather and for access to you. Please, Father, put the words in my heart which you would like me to speak that will come out of my mouth and please inspire the hearers that only that which is of you they will retain. We ask in the name of thy beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I was going to preach a message on unity, but the brothers and I couldn't agree what the content should be. Actually, today's message will be on the subject of unity, specifically how the quality of our unity will either turn people toward or away from the living God and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Important because Daniel 12.3 tells us, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Brethren, what then is to become of those who turn people away from him? The Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Rechabites, the Ammonites, the Israelites, the Judahites, the Luddites, the Russellites, the Millerites, the Mennonites, the Stalactites, and Stalagmites. Sounds similar to a partial list of the 30,000 Christian denominations? Actually, only the Mennonites are a real one, and I can pick on them because I was a Mennonite. Yes? Uh, the Russellites would be the predecessors of what we would call the Jehovah Witnesses today, and the Millerites would be the predecessors of what we'd call the Seventh-day Adventists. Okay, our text today is 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 12. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 12. Let's start, my brethren, by turning to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. That's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. We're going to see by the context who Paul was talking to. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So in case we wonder who our brother Paul is talking to, he wasn't only talking to an ancient people in an ancient culture way back there in a place halfway across the world. He's talking to all that in every place, and I might add, every time, call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Let's go to our text, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment that there be no divisions among you, that ye be perfectly joined together, and that ye all speak the same thing. This verse is sometimes used to say we must have no tolerance for differences. You know, we all speak the same thing. We all have the same opinions. Is that what Paul meant? Brethren, I believe he meant just the opposite. We live in a world with knowledge exploding. Daniel 12.4 told us that in the last days, people would run to and fro and knowledge would increase. The Bible's been translated into at least 531 languages. Some portion of the Bible has been translated into at least 2,883 languages. We have a uh, literal explosion of Bible helps and language helps and lexicons and concordances and the incredible selection of translations even in our own language, English. So, we can get on the internet and we can find teachings from just about any denomination under the sun. 
Well, we do not live in the world of the Waltons, where all we hear are the doctrines of the church we grew up in that's on the corner, that we go to the rest of our life, and our grandfather went to, and maybe helped to build. And by the way, could we even learn anything from someone who believed exactly the way we did anyway? Let's move on to verse 11 in our text, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 11. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions. There are contentions. So that's what the problem was in the church of Corinth, or one of the problems anyway. We're going to see some of the others later, further in scripture, but... The problem he was talking about, about divisions and speaking the same thing and the same judgment, was that there were contentions, not that people had different opinions. So, <clears throat> what is a contention? For that matter, what is a division? Well, the word in the original Greek for division is schismata. Schismata, like schism, like a chasm, like a break, like a gap. So if we were now in our congregation here to break off into groups and divide into contending parties and sects, each bearing the name of their leader or their principal doctrine, that's what Paul was talking about. That's what we shouldn't do. Now in verse 12, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. I am Wesleyan, I am Lutheran, I am Mennonite, I am Hutterite, I am from the Church of St. John's, I am from the Church of St. Paul's, all named after men. So we're kind of a victim of that, but nothing we can do about that, except make sure we don't repeat the mistake here. Now I'm picking on other denominations, but only for an example. It seems that saying, I follow Christ, is the safest, or the best of the options mentioned, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, Christ. Why did Paul condemn that, as well as those who followed after men? Because what usually happens is, after we break off into our new exclusive denominations, we refuse to accept as Christians those who aren't in our group. As quoted from Ligonier Ministries, that was R.C. Sproul's group, we cannot, quote, lock ourselves up in very small groups with maximal agreement on doctrine and morals and then separate from others and refuse to acknowledge as Christians those who do not embrace all our distinctives. The multiplication of small groups who pride themselves on purity, but who denounce and despise those who fall short of that standard does nothing to express the truth of, quote, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, unquote, for which Christ died. The love we must have for all of Christ's disciples has no expression in this path. And by Catholic, he meant Catholic with a small c. He didn't mean a denomination. So, brethren, if we can take a diverse group like this and keep the unity of Christ on the essentials, we have fulfilled what Brother Paul was admonishing us to do. Spuriously attributed to St. Augustine, but actually traced to its earliest occurrence from Rupertus Maldinius, among the Lutheran Reformed Churches, in the year 1627, he wrote the following words. In essentials, unity. In doubtful matters, liberty. In all things, charity. In essentials, unity. In doubtful matters, liberty. In all things, love. This sums up what Paul is getting at. Albert Barnes, author of the classic multi-volume commentary written in the mid-1800s, 
Barnes' Notes on the Bible expresses it thus. Although perfect uniformity of opinion cannot be expected among men on the subject of religion any more than on other subjects, yet on the great and fundamental doctrines of Christianity, Christians may be agreed. On all points in which they differ, they may clearly evidence a good spirit, and on all subjects they may express their sentiments in the language of the Bible, and thus speak the same thing. Let's turn to John 17, verse 21. Let's see what Jesus said. John 17, 21 and 22. This should really be called the Lord's Prayer because this is the prayer that the Lord made. John seventeen twenty one and 22. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are. That's what we want people to know. That's what we want them to believe, that God sent Jesus Christ. And the way they know that is when we are one, even as Christ and the Father are one. Do you think people believe that Christ is one with the Father if they see us squabbling with our mates, with our friends, with other brethren over religious minutia? Let's go on to verse 23. John 17, verse 23, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me, and hast loved them. This is what we want people to know, that Jesus loves them, that God loves them. How can they know if they don't even see love between us? And love, not just in word, but in deed. Turn with me, please, to the first epistle of the love apostle John. 1 John 3.18 1 John 3.18 1 John 3.18 My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. That's what we tell the people we witness to. Jesus loves you. People we meet on the street, in town, the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the downtrodden, the castaways of society, the divorcees, the lonely, the drunks, the unemployed, the injured, the hurting. We tell them Jesus loves you. That's what we want them to know. That's what we want them to see. We don't tell them Jesus is the Word, the Bible, and God has a lifetime of study for you to become intellectually stimulated by the various doctrines and mysteries and histories contained therein. Now, aren't you comforted? No, we tell them, my friend, Jesus loves you. Follow him. Learn of him. He'll help you. He'll comfort you. Brethren, my dear brethren, we are admonished. In 1 John 4, verse 20. 1 John 4, verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? What chance do those without have of seeing God? The unregenerate haven't seen God, 
God is a spirit. Except ye be born again, you cannot see the kingdom. Only through our example will they ever see God. Would we be willing to sacrifice for one another that many could come to see and then know God? That many sons could come to glory? Turn to John fifteen thirteen, please. John 15, verse 13. John fifteen thirteen. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Can we even lay down our opinions for our friends, let alone our life? All right, let's go back to our text now in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. What is the meaning of perfectly joined together? How can we, in these bodies, in this life, be perfectly joined together? Well, let's look into the Greek. The Greek suggests a mending, as it's also used, the same Greek word, in Matthew 4.21, where the fishermen are mending their nets, a repairing of something that is in disorder. The same Greek word is used in Galatians 6, verse 1, but here it's translated restore, where it says that one overtaken in a fault should be restored by those who think they're spiritual, but in the spirit of meekness and fear. In Luke 6, 40, the same word is rendered perfect, as in we are like our master if we are being perfected, or made complete. This seems to indicate that rather than all of us forcing each other to have the same opinions, wear the same clothes, etc., we are rather to allow God to perfect us, complete us, and mend the proclivities fallen people have toward disputing one with another. This is achieved by exercising self-control, and God the Holy Spirit will assist us in this regard if we don't resist Him. Please turn over to John 13.35. John 13.35. <clears throat> John 13.35 By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. If ye have love one to another. He didn't say if we have perfect knowledge or perfect doctrine or do everything the same. And God doesn't allow us to decide how it is proper to love one another. Sometimes we can get the wrong impression and think we are doing somebody's service by being harsh on them to get them to perform as we think they ought. But look in the verse prior, John 13.34. John 13.34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. So it's a Christ-like love. Now we see that the church at Corinth came together, supposedly to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, but instead just use the gathering as an occasion for debate, disputes, and divisions. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians 11.17. 1 Corinthians 11.17-20 through 20. 1 Corinthians 11.17 now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, 
This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, 1 Corinthians 13 is popularly known as the love chapter. But 1 Corinthians 12 is the body chapter, which shows us how we are to conduct ourselves one with another to function as Christ intended us to. If our arm smacks our own face, or if our foot kicks our shin, we just won't function right. But contrarily, if our hand reaches out and massages a bruise or cramp on our leg and comforts it, we will do well. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 22. 1 Corinthians 12, 22 through 26. 1 Corinthians 12, 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Such is God's design. Those in the church who seem to us to be not quite with it or don't fit in, we cannot just regard. Rather, we owe them more of our attention. Not to let them sit alone and feel uncared for, as soon as we make a judgment call that someone is a recluse or cast away, it is our duty to reach out and bestow more abundant honor on that person. My dear brethren, let us go back to 1 Corinthians 1.10 again, please. And let's take a second sweep through this and see what we can pick up. 1 Corinthians 1.10 says we ought to be perfectly joined together in the same mind. What does that mean, in the same mind? This is not to say that <clears throat> we have to have the same opinion about everything, but rather that we're heading in the same direction. We have the same goal. And we have goodwill toward each other, not suspicion. Turn, please, over to Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. Romans 15, 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus, that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God even the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. It talks about being of the same judgment. What does that mean? Well, I understand that to mean that we are united in feelings and sentiment united in feelings and sentiment, even if our opinions vary widely. Even holding that other people who differ from us could be right. I think if we have that kind of an attitude that others who differ could be right and we could be wrong, we will begin to have the unity that Christ would like to see in us. Now let's go back to the church at Corinth very poor example. We see them dragging each other before the unbelievers at the court in the town square, instead of settling matters between themselves. That must have been quite a sight to those not in the faith, 
and a terrible testimony and witness. It surely is still being repeated today in the body of Christ. I have heard all kinds of excuses from people when confronted with this one. The one they're suing in the courts, they say, well, he isn't really a believer. Let's look at the example here in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and 2. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust, and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Okay, let's shift gears here and go to the chapter that is the grease in the gears of the body of Christ, which keeps us from grinding each other to death. If this is followed in heart and spirit that it was intended, Romans 14 is a beautiful chapter. Romans 14, verses 1 through 4, please. Romans 14, verses 1 through 4. Romans 14, verses 1 through 4. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So we are to welcome those into our fellowship who differ in opinion from us, and not just to challenge them to a debate about why they're different. Continuing in verse 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things, Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. Brethren, I've heard people who refused meat get this chapter thrown at them as if it said they're obligated to eat it. They totally miss the point of this chapter. It's to let others be, to live and let live if somebody has a different opinion or conviction. How else can we have unity if we cannot bring ourselves to self-sacrifice enough to consider someone else's point of view that's different than our own? There's no merit in unity when we're all in agreement. The purpose of laying down our lives for one another is only counted a sacrifice when we are not in agreement with that person on something. Some people have problems with meat, for health reasons. The meat these days is subjected to all kinds of mistreatment from feeding the cow grains, hormones, antibiotics, to improper slaughter and improper storage, as well as processing. Some are vegetarians because they don't like the idea of slaughtering animals in the first place. Others only eat certain kinds of meat and not others. In Paul's day, the issue was often not eating meat that someone had previously offered to idols. Of what profit is it if we, as Christians, dispute with them over such private and minuscule things that we have no right to interfere on? Let's jump down to verse 10, please. Romans 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? Why dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verses 12 and 13. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. 
That's what we should be concentrating on. Not asserting our own beliefs upon that poor vegetarian brother who in our mind just doesn't understand that God has cleansed all meats, nothing is unclean of itself, all he has to do is pray over it, no weapon formed against him shall prosper, how dare he ask questions for conscience sake, and so on. I'm skipping around in this chapter to save time and to make my point. Please read the whole chapter later in its context on your own. Let's jump down to verses 15 through 19. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify one another. Admonishing the Corinthians again on unity, come with me to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23 and 24, please. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23 and 24. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. Paul is expressing that even if we feel something is permitted to us, we ought not pressure others who believe it is not permitted to them. And in some cases, we ought not even do it in front of them or let them be aware that we do it. I know this sounds strange. Why would we hide what we're doing if we're not doing anything wrong? Why do it in secret? I am aware that this may seem foreign to some, but it is a scriptural practice of love and produces true unity among the brethren. Okay, let's go to another verse. You guessed it, 1 Corinthians. Please turn with me to chapter 8, my dear brethren. 1 Corinthians 1. I mean, 1 Corinthians 8, verses 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians 8, verses 8 and 9. But meat commendeth us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now jump down to verse 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. These are hard words to take. But if we really want to have the kind of unity that Christ has with his Father, to the end that the lost and hurting see our example and desire what we have, then this is the challenge the Lord laid upon my heart this day to present. Let me close with Romans 15, verse 7. Romans 15, verse 7. Romans 15, verse 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God, Amen.